Well, hello. I am delighted to be here. I'm with Stephanie Kelton. Um, uh, before we begin, I just wanted to make a few housekeeping remarks. So first, please note that this afternoon's conversation on the deficit and the continued e economic implications of coronavirus is on the record. Um, secondly, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs is an independent and nonpartisan platform. The views expressed by individuals hosted on the program are, on, are their own and do and institutional positions or views of the council. Lastly, in about 30 minutes or so, we're also going to incorporate your questions into the conversation. If you have a question uh, you'd like to ask the panel, please submit one online by typing ccga.live, again, that's ccga.live into your web browser. Then you can also vote for your favorite question and engage with other members of the audience. So I'm delighted to be here, and we'll put that in quotes, <laughs> with this afternoon's guest, Stephanie Kelton. She served as the Chief Economist on the U.S. Senate Budget Committee in 2015 and as a Senior Economic Advisor to Bernie Sanders' 2016 and 2020 presidential campaigns. She currently works as a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University, and her latest book, the Deficit Myth, Modern Monetary Theory and the Birth of the People's Economy is available for sale from the council's local Chicago book partner, the bookseller. We'll be circulating the direct link for purchases here on Zoom throughout the program. So last spring, the New Yorker wrote this about, about, about Stephanie, which I thought was pretty awesome. She, the New Yorker wrote, among a certain crowd, mostly online and mostly on the left, MMT has ignited a revolutionary fervor. Kelton is, more than anyone, responsible for building MMT's digital army. Um, at the Wall Street Journal's Future, Future of Everything Festival, they introduced her with this remark. MMT will either solve the world's problems or send it into ruin. So, Stephanie, I'm, I'm going to guess you're voting for solving the world. I'd like to believe if those are the two options, that's the one, that's the one we end up with. So start by explaining. You, you talk about something called the deficit myth. Why don't you start by explaining that? Sure. And thank you uh, for agreeing to sit down with me and to the council for the invitation to do this. Um, I, I do wish that there was just one deficit myth because it would make my job a lot easier. We could just dispel one myth and then, you know, move on. Unfortunately, um, I think it's, a, it's more like a web of interrelated myths that get all tangled up with one another, which is why the first six chapters of the book are devoted to the, the sort of myth busting, taking them in turn. Um, but the place that I start is with the idea that the federal government is essentially like a giant household and that we should think of the government's finances in much the same way that we think of our own. And so it's the, the first and I think most pernicious myth is that the government's budget works like a household budget. And, you know, they, we've all heard this done. We hear politicians talk like this. We hear journalists engage in this kind of discourse. And it resonates with us because the finances that we're most familiar with are, of course, our own. So when people start talking to us in ways that use familiar language to talk about the federal government's budget, we say, oh, of course that makes sense. The government shouldn't spend more than it takes in. It should save something. It should avoid taking on debt. Uh, or it could get into financial trouble. It could end up with bills coming due that it can't afford to pay. It could go broke. I mean, even, you know, President Obama used language like this. You know, he talked about how the country had run out of money. Um, we talked about the need to tighten the belt, you know, like, uh, like a household would and to live within our means. So uh, one of the places that I begin in the book and that MMT starts is by helping people to recognize the difference between the federal government and everybody else. So why do they get to operate their budget differently? What makes them different from us? And the, the critical part of the story is that the federal government is the issuer of our currency, the US dollar. The United States government has the sole legal authority to issue our currency. You and I can't do it. You see, if we get caught trying to do it, it's, it's called counterfeiting, it's illegal, we go to jail. If I could issue the dollar, why I would never worry about bills coming due that I can't afford to pay. If businesses could issue the currency, then the Fed wouldn't have all of these uh, lending facilities established to help businesses that are struggling right now to help get them uh, lines of credit and access to the currency. If state and local governments 
could issue the dollar. Governors around the country and mayors wouldn't be pleading with the federal government, with Congress, to provide aid. So the key distinction is between all of us, the users of the currency, and the federal government, the issuer of the currency. And then once we recognize that, we can unravel a lot of the other myths that we're confronted with. But that's where I start. So before we get to that, let's back up and, and talk about you and how you came to your views on MMT, because it's a really interesting story. You had your own, as you describe it, almost Copernican moment, which I thought was a pretty compelling way of describing the, the, the way in which your worldview can shift. Yeah, so, you know, I was, um, I was studying finance and economics as an undergraduate. I did degrees in, in both of those areas, uh, undergraduate degrees, and then I went off to Cambridge University and I started a graduate program where I mostly um, took courses from conventional, uh, you know, in conventional economics, and I had a macro theory course, and they brought a string of people through to lecture and everything that I was confronted with essentially was um, oriented around this view of the federal government as um, revenue constraint, that the government has a budget constraint just like a household has a budget constraint. And this was in 1996. Well, I got a fellowship through uh, one of the colleges at Cambridge to go to the Levy Economics Institute, which is a think tank in upstate New York. And that's where someone, uh, some researchers were working on projects and somebody um, shared with me a little book written by a man named Warren Mosler. And Mosler is not an economist, well, not really uh, by training. He comes from the, the finance world. He came from Wall Street. And so he's someone who I think deeply understood not just financial markets, but the monetary system and monetary operations. And he had thought through some things and he wrote this little book and he called it soft currency economics. Soft currency as distinct from hard currency, like not a gold standard, but the monetary system that we have today. So he called it soft currency. And I read this thing, now it's 1997, and it just turned my world upside down. And I thought, you know, on the one hand you think, this is clearly backwards, this can't be right because it runs counter to everything that you've been trained. You've been at this prestigious university and, you know, at Cambridge. And on the other hand, you think it can't be right. But on the other hand, you think this is a really smart guy, you know, who's, who's in this world and maybe he's not wrong. You know, maybe he knows something I don't. And that just sort of ate away at me. And I needed to try to understand whether he might possibly be right. So I started reading all of these, you know, the thing that he said in there that really struck me as it can't be true is that the government, uh, the government spends first and it taxes and borrows after it has spent. And that the way that we think of taxing and borrowing is wrong because we think the government collects taxes from us in order to get money and that it borrows in order to get money. And then after it does those things, now it has money and it can spend. And Warren said, no, 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 it has to spend first. And the only way that anybody can have the dollars to pay taxes or buy bonds is if the government first spends the dollar into existence. It has to come from somewhere before anybody can get it. And that resequencing just was jarring for me. So anyway, I spent a lot of months reading Treasury and Fed manuals and talking to people and monetary operations and debt management at Treasury and Fed and trying to figure out how this all works in practice. And much to my surprise, I managed to convince myself that Warren was right and that the you know, conventional models and thinking that I'd been trained on uh, was getting it backwards. Hence your phrase about a Copernican moment. As it, uh, maybe in conventional economics, the we the government revolves around us, and in this view, we revolve around the government. <laughs> but at least it's a switch in a worldview, right? Yeah, that's right. And and in the book, I do use that analogy that you know, once upon a time, we thought the Earth sat here, and and the sun, you know, uh, revolved around the Earth, and it was only you know after a long period of struggle to come to terms with the reality. Um, that the earth is revolving around the sun, you know? And, and so we've got this idea that the taxpayer sits at the center of the monetary universe and everything is run around the taxpayer. So we always hear, well, it's tax 
cost money and how are we going to pay for it and whose taxes are going to go up? And we put the taxpayer at the middle instead of recognizing the currency issuer belongs at the center when we talk about public finance and the taxpayer is a peripheral player. So why are mainstream economists so reluctant to embrace this view? Obviously, MMT has gained adherence in recent years, but you tried to argue even during the Obama administration years that we needed to address the 2000, this meant we could address the 2008 financial crisis more aggressively. It wasn't a view widely adopted even by that, even by that administration. Um, a main, relatively mainstream economist described MMT to me as a cult. Why the dismissiveness? Well, I think there are probably lots of different answers to the question, depending maybe upon who we're talking about. I think, um, you know, I spent a little bit of time, and I, uh, as you mentioned, or as it was mentioned in the intro, I, I worked in the Senate for a little while. Um, you know, politics is a contact sport. <laughs> That's kind of the only way I can say it. And once you begin to sort of play in that world and you get called upon by members of Congress and relied upon for your policy expertise, for testimony and that sort of thing, people get very comfortable in that role and in that world. And if there's a group that's providing different um, analysis and saying things that are challenging some of what you're telling policymakers and the advice that you're giving, then you come into conflict because now policymakers have a, a new choice, right? There's a new kid in town. And this group over here is saying things that challenge the voices that I've been relying upon for my policy expertise. And sometimes people don't want to share that space with others. And so they try to make sure that they try to discredit your thinking or um, protect that space for themselves. I think there's some of that that's going on. Another thing is you know, it's hard. I, I feel very fortunate in that I came to these ideas while I was still in graduate school, which meant that I had not committed myself in writing to a, a lot of um, publications. I didn't have 10 or 20 years of um, published work under my belt, which I then would have had to say, oh, geez, you know, I, I have to, now what? I've made all these arguments for so many years, and now I have to start shifting positions. Um, so you tend to defend your positions that you've taken in the past and not want to accommodate new thinking because in some sense it reveals shortcomings in your own previous work. And so I think there's probably some of that happening as well. So one of the most profound implications of MMT, it strikes me, is on the unemployment rate. So talk about that. Right. So, you know, the, if you, ha if anybody happened to listen to Chairman Powell, who this morning has been giving um, remarks, testimony, um, the Federal Reserve is basically in charge. Congress put the Federal Reserve in charge of steering our economy. For the most part, the Federal Reserve has what's called a dual mandate, which means you, you got two jobs. You're supposed to deliver maximum sustainable employment and price stability. So basically give us um, some, do something on the employment job side and don't let inflation uh, accelerate out of control. And so what the Fed does is basically what all central banks do, which is to try to figure out how much unemployment is too much unemployment. So they're looking at the jobs numbers. They see that there are millions of people who are seeking jobs, but they're not able to find work anywhere in the economy. It might part of this, there's the belief that there should be some unemployment, right? Yeah, and that's that's exactly right. So they're looking at these numbers and they may say, wow, you know, seven million people are in search of jobs but not currently working. We think that's about the right number, right? We think that that's what we call the natural rate of unemployment. And so what the Fed is doing is seeking out, now there's another way to refer to it, which is the non-accelerating inflationary rate of unemployment or the NIRU, we get really crazy with our uh, terminology, but this is econo-speak for the right level of unemployment. In other words, the Fed is trying to figure out how many people to hold in, in limbo, right? Wanting to work, but not able to actually secure employment. How many people need to be locked out of employment in order to prevent inflation from rising above the Fed's target? So we actually label 
a thing full employment when it is uh, in when millions of people don't have to call that full employment. And so in the MMT framework, we say oh, this can't this can't be good enough, right? We shouldn't be labeling a certain amount of unemployment full employment. We could do better than that. And so MMT suggests that we could achieve genuine full employment where everyone who wants to work and actually have a job, and not only that, but that it would be a better price anchor, a better inflation stabilizer than what we currently practice today. And how does that work? And how, most importantly, does the government decide? So I think at least the way it, seems, it, it sounds like it works from reading your book is that the government sets the floor as, as an employer of last resort, in a sense. How, is that right? And, and how, what rate does the government decide to pay to set that floor? How does the government know how much they should offer? You, so first thing is, you are correct, uh, and you use this phrase, employer of last resort. And that's a phrase that an economist decades ago began using. His name was Hyman Minsky. And if people are followers and fans of finance, that might be a very familiar name. I know it is to you. So, you know, Minsky back as, as the 1960s uh, came up with this idea that um, he said, look, we have the Federal Reserve and the Fed is the lender of last resort. And the reason we created the Fed was because we recognized that without an institution like this, that when there is a liquidity crisis, when financial markets go haywire and people want to rush into the safest asset, get dollars and safe assets, there's nobody who stands prepared to supply all of the liquidity that markets require. So the Fed was created to, uh, to be a lender of last resort to stabilize the financial system. Minsky said, what we're lacking is an analogous institution on the fiscal side. We should have something that takes care of the real economy and the labor market. So he suggested an employer of last resort so that when the economy goes through its natural boom bust cycle, because we have business cycles and presumably always will, Minsky said, we could attenuate the instability in the economy the way we try to in the financial system with an employer of last resort policy, which would mean when the economy begins its downturn and businesses start shedding, laying off workers, instead of allowing them to just fall into the ranks of the unemployed, where they languish, their skills atrophy, and it becomes more and more difficult to ever employ them again because employers don't like to hire people with um, patchy work histories, right, long um, departures from the workforce and all that sort of stuff. So it gets harder to hire those people. Minsky said we could rehire them immediately into public disemployment. We could create jobs for them, maintain and enhance skills, provide education, keep them employed so they will be more employable when the recovery turns. Now you asked about the wage. So this is a big question, right? At what wage do you want to employ people when they get, you know, when they lose private sector jobs and they enter public service employment? So over the years, you know, we've changed because we started this more than 20 years ago. We used to say, give them jobs at, you know, the current minimum wage. Now everybody pretty much recognizes that the current minimum wage is inadequate and that we ought to pay something like a living wage. And so in the book, I, um, I talk about $15 an hour. You could have other approaches. It's, there isn't only one way to accomplish the, the job guarantee piece itself, but having a wage does help to anchor um, wages and hence prices. And so the idea would be that the program absorbs workers when the economy gets weak and it releases them back to the private sector as the economy recovers and businesses are prepared to hire. And so the answer to the question about how it's a better price stabilizer is that instead of firms having to compete intensively for workers when they want to rehire, instead of going to their competitor and trying to compete workers away from them, bidding up wages, they can hire workers out of this pool of employed people at a small markup over what they're earning, $15 an hour or whatever. And this, so it's less inflationary to maintain this sort of buffer stock of employed workers that are readily available to businesses, making it much easier for them to find qualified, skilled um, people with work records and so forth. 
want to come back to the notion of inflation because that's obviously very core to this. But so our lender of last resort, the Federal Reserve, is technically independent. Should the employer of last resort be technically independent as well, or should it be a, a, a function of Congress? Well, so here's the thing. Congress has to legislate it. Somebody has to pass this law, but once passed, the idea is that the program itself will operate independent of Congress. In other words, like right now, we've seen what, 44 million Americans file jobless claims in the last eight, eight weeks, three months, whatever it is, right? For, that's a lot of people, okay? And what we're watching is Congress passes a bill, they enhance unemployment insurance. Eventually, the UI, unemployment insurance, will expire. Then we'll wait around to see if Congress will extend it. Then we'll, you know, it's, you have to wait. Everything is an act of Congress right now. It takes an act of Congress, literally. If we had just one act of Congress, if they would write a bill and um, put in place a guarantee where anybody who qualifies, who, who comes in looking for work, the federal government covers the wages and benefits for that worker until, for as long as they're in the program. And when they transition out, they stop paying those uh, wages and benefits. But once the bill is passed to put the program in place, then it will run automatically in the same way Social Security uh, runs automatically or Medicare, right? If, if you meet the eligibility criteria, and here it's, I want a job, then the payments are triggered automatically, right? So it doesn't, and there's, that's a beauty, that's a feature of the program is that it becomes a very powerful new automatic stabilizer so that our economy would be protected in a moment like this where tens of millions of people are losing jobs. They could immediately be reemployed at a living wage um, and then, you know, skill enhancement and all of the rest of it. So I thought before I read your book that the key problem with MMT was that it violated this fundamental rule of economics that even a non-economist like myself knows, which is that there's no such thing as a free lunch. But it really doesn't, because as you write in the book, there is this upper bound on how much money the government can spend, right? And that upper bound is inflation. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So when I say that the, the federal government is not like a household because it's the issuer of our currency, I'm not saying party on, Wayne, right? Let's, uh, let's spend like, like spendthrifts. Let's, let's spend like crazy because there's no limits. So let's just go for everything. You're right. There are limits. And what MMT is about is trying to replace in the way that we approach the federal budget to replace artificial constraints with a real resource constraint, with an inflation constraint. So get rid of the myths that have us believing that, that um, we can't spend more because China won't give us dollars or because it burdens the next generation. Get, put all that stuff aside and let's recognize where the real limitations are. And so where are they? They're in our economy's productive capacity. So if, um, if the government hires, I'll just make this up off the cuff, I've never done this uh, example, but let's say the government hires uh, new workers to um, inspect food, right, plants around the country to make sure food safety, we're going to beef up our uh, food safety, to go to meat packing facilities and check, make sure that everything, you know, uh, food is safe, that sort of thing, that we're going to put some more people at HUD and they're going to go around the country and they're going to make sure that uh, people are following um, the rules and laws with respect to um, discrimination in housing and lending and all that kind of stuff. So the government hires uh, a number of people and says, this is your job. Now go out and, and monitor these sort of things. Well, they get on it. They have to book flights. They have to stay in hotels. They have to eat in restaurants. So the government is hiring someone, giving them a salary. Now they can afford to buy a home in a neighborhood. They can afford to go shopping. So the question then is, is all of that additional spending that that leads to, I'm going to put too much of a strain on our economy's productive capacity that it's going to start causing prices to go up. Because when they try to book a flight, the flight's already full. Now somebody else can't get a seat on the airplane. When they have to book a hotel room in you know South Dakota to go look at that meat packing, but there's no room available. And they want to you know go out and eat. The booths are all full. There's no capacity. Well, that would be excessive spending. We would have too much economic activity. It would put a strain on our productive capacity. We'd see inflationary pressures. So uh, 
there are limits to what the government can do. If we wanted to do a big infrastructure program and spend trillions of dollars modernizing, upgrading America's crumbling infrastructure, but the private sector was using all the construction workers and all the heavy machine equipment and we couldn't produce more, then the government would be competing with the private sector for those limited resources and we would get some price uh, inflationary pressure as a result. So the, the limit is how many how, how can safely be spent into the economy before you reach your capacity constraint, full employment, and then you're out of space. And how do you call it? How do you know when to call it? So my, in my non-economist brain, once inflation starts to spiral, it's too late. You're already, you've, already, you've already started the spiral. So when do you say this is the moment where we have to cut? How do you know? Yeah. So it's a great question, and here, here's the way I will answer it. First, the best defense against inflation is offense. It is not, you don't want to start trying to fight inflation after it begins to accelerate out of control. You want to think about the inflation risk associated with any new spending before you authorize that spending. So I'll give you an example. Um, you remember that I worked in the Senate for the Senate Budget Committee. And so there I was surrounded by Republicans and Democrats on this powerful budget committee in the Senate. There's a House Budget Committee. They write a budget. The Senate writes a budget. If you reconcile past budget, that's your budget. So uh, these are important decisions that are made. And I listened to um, senators offer amendments, offer, you know, introduce legislation. People wanted to spend money. I never once in my time in the Senate, not once did I hear a staffer or member of the Senate talk about inflation. Never happened. I never heard it. So what I'm saying is, yeah, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Why? Because it's the Fed's job, right? The, the Senate only cares about, can I get my bill through the Congressional Budget Office and can I get votes for my bill? That's all they care about. There, there's nobody stopping to think about inflation risk. So what I'm suggesting and what I argue in the book is that we should center inflation in the budgeting process so that if Congress is thinking about some ambitious new thing, whether it's a Green New Deal or just you know, regular infrastructure spending or healthcare or whatever it is, if they're approaching a question like, could we spend trillions of dollars doing X, Y, Z, I want someone involved in that process thinking about the inflation risk associated with that spending. Right now, the only consideration is, will it add to the deficit? And from my perspective, that's the wrong question because I can easily put legislation together that won't add to the deficit, but that would potentially create an inflation problem. And that's what I want us to fix. So maybe if I were trying to summarize I, I would, and tell me if this is right, I would say that maybe MMT doesn't have a perfect answer to the question of inflation, but it's not like we have to answer to the question of inflation now. Well, okay, that's fair. I think that's fair. And I also think that part of what I'm pushing and we're pushing is for economists to spend more time thinking about where those real limits are instead of obsessing over you know, the so-called sustainability of the debt and paying attention to, we, we, we see economists spending a lot of time thinking about um, modeling the debt and debt sustainability. I would much rather see us collectively as macroeconomists working harder to understand the inflation process. Inflation is really tricky. It's a dynamic process. It, you know, when it happens, it doesn't have a, a single root cause. It's not like all inflation is always and everywhere driven by an ex, you know, too much money uh, or central banks creating too much money. Uh, in fact, that, that's the least likely, I think. Um, and then this question of limits, you know, where, what is the economy's real productive capacity? There are a lot of economists who are working right now on getting better measurements for you know, potential output. What is the economy's real potential productive capacity and how do we identify that? So I'm going to ask a potentially complicated multi-part question. Let's see if I can get it out in, in one piece. But so under the MMT framework, there, another part of this being no free lunch is that taxes actually play a really important role. So I want you to address the role that taxes 
pay. But then secondly, there has been, a, I'm going to call it a conflation between MMT and a progressive agenda where the rich are taxed more heavily in order to re redistrib redistribute. And I don't, I don't understand why one has to be the other. In other words, why couldn't, as someone once said, Donald Trump be the ultimate MMT? president. It seems to me that there, these are two separate things. The, 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 the taxes obviously have to play a role in MMT, but why does taxing the rich to redistribute redist have to be part of MMT? Why couldn't it be, hey, the rich are wonderful and do all these marvelous things for our economy. Let's say the top 2% from now on don't pay any taxes and the bottom 90% pay all of the taxes. Okay, so I'll try to get uh, an answer to both questions in a single example. I want to see if I can pull this up. Um, so I think of government spending, all government spending today, not under a hypothetical, we could try it this way. I'm saying right now today and for decades, this is the works. When the government spends on anything, the result is new money is created. Okay, spending creates new dollars. So if you want, you think of like the life cycle of the dollar. The dollar is born when the government spends it into existence. Okay, so now there's a dollar out there. And now it will live for and it will travel around the economy, changing hands. I'll earn that dollar. I'll use it to pay uh, somebody for a meal. The restaurant owner will use it to pay the work. The worker will use it to pay the rent, the landlord, right? And so that dollar will travel around our economy until it is retired. And it is retired when we give it back to the government. So the tax is the death sentence for that dollar, okay? That's when the dollar leaves, leaves the earth, okay? So when- Literally same thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it's, I've never done that. It just sort of made that up. But um, but I think it works. And, I, and you know, the idea of redistribution, I think progressives uh, will often talk about, you know, Robin Hood. Everybody loved Robin Hood. He was a hero. He robbed from the rich and gave to the poor and, and helped uh, some people improve their lives. But you say, well, you know, we should use taxes for redistribution. And I think that where, um, from the MMT perspective, where this story runs awry of the operations, the op monetary operations, is that we have this idea that we take the money from the rich person and then give that same money to programs that are designed to lift people at the bottom, right? to help the poor and, and so forth. And what I'm saying is no, the spending on programs to lift people at the bottom is what gives rise or birth to those new dollars. That, that births new dollars, the taxing from the rich just retires. It's the death sentence for the dollar. We take it away from them. So they're separate and distinct acts. Not that we can't and shouldn't do some of each. Um, but the, the point is that we don't need the very wealthy in order to pay our bills, in order to be able to afford to expand or enhance programs that are there to support people who are genuinely um, you know, suffering and wh whose incomes are far too low. We can help those people with or without a tax on Jeff Bezos or the Waltons or anybody else, right? The reason to think about, I think, a uh, more progressive um, tax code or to introduce new taxes on the rich, because maybe we've reached the conclusion that the levels of income and wealth inequality that exist in America today are um, dangerous. They're not just bad for the the thing of our economy, but they are bad for democracy. They result in too much concentration of power, right, in the political process, those extreme concentrations. So we can think of the tax question independently of the way we think of the spending piece. But did I hit both parts of your question? But just to sum up, you would resist the idea that Donald Trump is the ultimate MMT president. Well, I don't, I mean, will I resist the idea? I think, here's what I think, and I'm going to lean into it a little bit, okay? Um, when, uh, when it was the fall of 2017, and the Republicans were talking about the tax cuts, and everybody knew that this thing was going to come up for a vote, and there were a lot of economists of, you know, who are Democrats and served in previous administrations, you know, Democratic presidencies and, and so forth, they said a number of things, but this is objectionable because who does stimulus late cycle? They didn't believe 
that you were supposed to do fiscal stimulus, spend more or cut taxes, late cycle. And to them, the, it was crazy that the government would do something to kind of step on the accelerator if the economy was at the end of a long business cycle. And to me, I thought, well, what better time, right, to apply a little bit of, um, of gas if you think the economy is reaching the end of the cycle, if you think a downturn is coming, why wait for the economy to turn down and go into recession? If you, if you make the proper fiscal adjustment now, you can prolong the recovery. And, um, and, and so the tax cuts in and of themselves didn't bother me, but they did bother a lot of um, my friends sort of on the left. And they said, you don't do this at the, at the late stage of the business cycle. Um, some of them said, if these tax cuts go through, if they pass, the federal government is going to be living on a shoestring for decades to come. That's actually a quote from a former Treasury Secretary who served in the Obama administration. Uh, and, and so the point is, here come the Republicans, right? They do it. They pass it, and the deficit increases, and the increases and it was supposed to be the end of the world. It was going to leave us incapable of responding to the next downturn because we would have used up all of our ammo and we wouldn't have any more money to spend and no more fiscal capacity. And where are we? Coronavirus comes, Congress senses, uh, you know, an emergency and quickly moves four pieces of legislation through no pay force, um, adding trillions of dollars to the deficit and no problem, no inflation problem. Interest rates are managed because the Fed keeps raising. Like, so none of the things that they told us would be punishing us if we were to add to the deficit with the tax cuts have happened. So is Trump an MMT or I don't know, I go that far, but he certainly recognized and Republicans in Congress recognized that um, Congress has the power of the purse and that yesterday's deficits don't constrain today's or tomorrow's uh, fiscal capacity. Well, I could keep asking you questions forever, but so could our audience because we have a lot of them. Okay. So this is um, a great transition to this question that um, you've said that MMT is politically agnostic, but have any Republicans backed it? And I'm guessing from what you just have said, maybe they haven't backed it by saying I back MMT, but their actions perhaps have backed it. Is that I think so. I sure do. And, you know, I won't name names, but I can tell you that I do get uh, inquiries, emails, phone calls, requests for dialogue, um, sometimes from, from staffers or from Republicans in the House or Senate. So it does happen. Um, it, you know, I would like to see us have a better policy debate, and I'd like to see better public policy coming out of Congress. So if I can be helpful, I try to be helpful in the sense that, you know, MMT is a lens. There, it's a framework for understanding where the limits lie. And um, I can give that lens to someone with a conservative orientation. I can give that lens to someone with a more progressive orientation. Both will get a clearer picture of how things work and where the limits are, but they will naturally pursue different ends, you know, with with that understanding, so. But there's another one, which I'm gonna put, which ties into a question I wanted to ask, so I'm gonna put my spin on it. How has MMT applied to international finance in other nations? Um, for example, Latin American debt crises, IMF, Washington consensus, austerity imposed on developing countries, et cetera. And as a small continuum to, to that, all sovereign issue, all currency issues aren't created equal, right? The United States can do things that Greece and Venezuela cannot. So. So the, the issue isn't just being able to issue your own currency. There's something more complicated going on. That's right. Um, it's difficult to do all the nuances in, in a, yeah, uh, but, but you're right. And I know it sounds to me like if you didn't read my book, you've, you've read enough MMT elsewhere that you know what we're arguing. So chapter five in my book is the trade chapter. I give this international perspective and the, the person asking the question is exactly right. Um, we talk about monetary sovereignty and, um, you know, some countries have a lot of it and some countries have very little and monetary sovereignty is really the key to uh, a nation's ability to orient their macroeconomic policy, their monetary and fiscal policy to, to um, 
orient them around maintaining a good, healthy domestic economy, full employment and low inflation. So if you don't have a lot of monetary sovereignty, then you're really stuck. You, you are constrained in ways that Japan, the UK, the US, Australia, Canada, we, these are countries with a lot of monetary sovereignty. You mentioned um, Venezuela, uh, Greece. Let's just hit a couple of them very quickly because I know we, you want to get more questions in. But, you know, Greece joined the Economic and Monetary Union. And so when Greece its sovereign currency, the drachma, and began um, spending and borrowing and taxing in a currency that it cannot issue, it was a game changer for Greece, right? The only way that the Greek government can literally pay the bills is if it can acquire the euro in some form or fashion. It can raise the taxes or borrow the euro. The problem is when the Greek government borrows euro on financial markets and capital markets, lenders recognize rightly that the Greek government isn't a currency issuer and that it may in fact run into a situation where the debts are coming due and they don't have the cash flow. They don't have the money to service the debt. Go to Venezuela or Argentina, countries that borrow heavily in US dollars. You start borrowing in a currency that you can't issue, there's always the risk that something will happen um, to the price of oil or some other um, way that you rely on to earn dollars to service your debt. So uh, there's a lot more in that chapter that deals with, you know, developing countries, Latin American countries and so forth. But that's, um, that's a quick and dirty thumbnail. There are so many great questions in here. Oh, good. Not many more. So I'm just going to go to two that I think um, are particularly relevant to where we are as a country, right? And the first one is this, how can municipalities participate in the MMT policy space? Get loans from the central bank, organize municipal public banks? In other words, what implications does MMT have for our increasingly cash-strapped municipalities? Yeah, well, let me start by saying the, the most straightforward way to get aid to state and local governments is for Congress to dispense the funds. That That is the the most straightforward way to do this. Now, are there ways to um, to involve the Federal Reserve? Yes. And rather than sp spend what little time we have left going through that, let me suggest um, some work by an economist um, named Nathan Tankis, who is an MMT person and also a legal scholar who's been writing quite a bit about this lately. I think David Ayan, uh, has a piece for the prospect uh, out recently in which he features some of Nathan's work. So there are things that the Fed can do. Uh, they could do them very quickly and painlessly, and it would uh, be another way to get aid quickly to municipalities and, and state governments. So another question. Uh, what do you think should be the three biggest priority areas for additional government spending? You talk in your book, for example, about a green economy. Really important. Is that where we should be looking right now, given the difficulties coming out of this pandemic? I mean, I think we should be looking right now, but I think the legislation that we need urgently to come out of Congress is you know, we have to do something to support incomes. There's just no question. We know that there's a cliff and that cliff for millions and millions of Americans is July 31st, that, um, you know, the top up in unemployment uh, compensation, that $600 a week that has been such a critical lifeline to so many people who have lost jobs, that is going to expire. We have got, Congress has got to do something there in their own interest. I mean, you know, it is an election year and you do have Republicans in the Senate have been sort of the obstructionists on doing uh, additional um, stimulus, but I think they're going to have to see the writing on the wall here and recognize in their own interest that you can't allow things to deteriorate rapidly by um, not extending support right now. So we have to do that. On the payroll protection, that was a good idea. You know, keeping small businesses, trying to keep small businesses afloat and to keep work attached to their employers. That was all, I think, exactly the right thing to do. We just didn't execute it very well. We didn't have the infrastructure in place that some European countries who've done this before, they were able to um, execute this much better. And we tried at the last minute to sort of cobble things together and the conditions and then tell small businesses, go find a lender and do this and jump through that. 
and it just didn't quite go off without a hitch. You know, we had a cap and the program ran out of money and we had to run back and, and top it up. So, um, you know, maybe doing as we learn and we get better at this sort of thing, I think, you know, the idea of getting cash to people. There are proposals to send, um, you know, Canada's been doing it. Uh, they send a couple of thousand Canadian dollars to almost every Canadian, you know, uh, those that have been impacted by the COVID uh, and, and that's some income support. We could be doing that. And then I think as important as anything, state and local governments. I mean, they, they need probably a trillion. There's legislation to do that. That's in the HEROES Act. I think other members of Congress have a 500 billion that they're ready to launch if the Senate will take it up. So those are the three big ones. The the longer term picture, and I think we should, the answer is we should be thinking about it now, but we can't necessarily move aggressively yet with a full rollout of a big ambitious um, piece of legislation to deal with climate. But we could start putting that legislation together and when the time is right, and we can begin to hire a lot of workers and send them safely back out to begin you know, building millions of units of housing and sustainable infrastructure and, you know, broadband and the whole, the whole gamut. And it's time to do that as well. So I'm absolutely heartbroken to have to wrap up. I could continue doing this to, for, forever. And apologies to everyone whose questions I didn't get to. There were so many good ones. A huge thank you to you, Stephanie. This was awesome. I want to encourage everybody to buy Stephanie's book, even if you end up disagreeing with it. I think Personally, I think the most valuable moments in intellectual life come when you're forced to rethink things that you've always held held dear and at least forced to contemplate that Copernican moment, even if you don't end up um, endorsing it. It makes your mind a little bit bigger. So I'll encourage everyone to read the book. Um, a recording of this program will be available on the council's website and, and social channels shortly. And we encourage you to share it all within your networks. And thank you all once again. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Bethany.